Welcome to the online worship presentation from Green Valley Evangelical Lutheran Church this Sunday. You can follow along with the worship service by using the uh, worship folder that's available for you on the button that just uh, uh, down below the screen you're watching. And also a copy of today's sermon is available on the other button. Um, we sing the first hymn. Mercy on me, O Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. This morning we rejoice to worship our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The word from God's prophet is recorded in Genesis chapter 28, beginning in verse 10. Jacob dreams of a ladder. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. <clears throat> I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. 
Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This is the word from God's prophet. The psalm for today is Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure, and have washed my hands in innocence, all day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your, your children. When I tried to understand all this, I, it troubled me deeply, till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on a slippery slope. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as, it, as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. The word from God's apostle is recorded in Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Christ died for the ungodly. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life. Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. 
This is the word from God's apostle. <clears throat> the word from God's son, the gospel, is recorded in Mark chapter 8, <coughs> beginning at verse 31. Jesus rebukes Peter. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my world and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. This is the gospel of our Lord. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing the hymn of the day.
I bring you a message of grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God before us today is recorded in Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38, the Gospel lesson, as we was read previously. I'd emphasize these verses. But Jesus turned and looked at his disciples. He rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is the word of our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, if you were God, how would things go? How would you save the world? It might seem crazy, but in spite of uh, our different backgrounds and the different ways we have at looking at life, uh, we'd probably all go about it in the same way. We'd show overwhelming power to strike fear in everyone. Then we'd have a come to Jesus meeting and set them straight and tell them that they are all to fall in line. Shock and awe, repeat as necessary. We could lighten up a little bit later on. Yes, you have to crack a few eggs to make an omelet, but the ends of getting people to heaven justify cutting corners. Easy on the love and trust, heavy on the fear. That's why Jesus' words before us today come as such a shock to Peter and the other followers of Jesus, including us. God took the unexpected way, the unexpected way, suffering, humility, fellowship, the unexpected way. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Jesus began to teach them the part of the Apostles' Creed we know as he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again from the dead. It was the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That's gospel. The good news that for the sake of Jesus, suffering and death, God no longer counts sin against us. We, everyone, the world is forgiven in God's sight. Amen. If that were the way we expected things to go, I could sit right down now. The sermon would be over. But this is the unexpected way. First of all, why should Jesus suffer? Well, he had to suffer because of my sins. He was rejected because of your sins. He had to be killed because of the sins of the world. Sin is rebellion against God. Sin says, I don't care what God says. I want if there's a violent riot or an uprising, say, say in Moscow, the government is not going to like it. It views that violence as a challenge to its authority. Don't be surprised if the tanks are called out to roll over protesters armed with butt rocks and bottles. That's what sin is, rebellion against God. As Americans, we sort of sympathize with protesters in autocratic or corrupt countries. The governments are not taking care of their people the way they should. Protests are understandable. But there is no reason in God's green earth that we should rebel against God. Our sins even amaze God. What have I done to you? How have I burdened you, he says in Micah. 
What more could have been done? He says to the prophet Isaiah, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. There is absolutely no reason to rebel against the Lord. He is the giver of life. He created and sustains this wonderful world we call our own. Giving us our daily bread, that's too small a thing for the Lord. He satisfies the desires of every living thing. He has a home in heaven waiting for us. And even when sin stood in the way, your sin, my sin, that did not stop him. He reached out his arms to us again and again. He sent prophets. He sent angels. He sent his word into our world. And if that were not enough, he sent his Holy Spirit into our hearts so that we believed that he had sent his son to take all our sins away. I would not have done that. You wouldn't have put up with generation after reject, generation of rejection either. Nobody wants to be treated like a doormat. But that's the unexpected way of Jesus. Suffering. We can see another aspect of that unexpected way. Humility. When we look at Peter's outlandish reaction to Jesus' words. Jesus spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Peter is having none of it. While Mark's gospel legend has it that it is the remembered life through the eyes of Peter, doesn't disclose the reason behind Peter's objections. It's, it's not hard to guess. When the day of Jesus' suffering and death were just around the corner, Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. It's the lowliest job of the lowliest servant. None of the disciples volunteered to do it, so Jesus did it. He comes to Peter, and Peter objects. Lord, you will never wash my feet. Jesus was too good to wash Peter's feet. It was beneath Jesus. Peter would be, Peter would be ashamed to have such a Lord as his Savior. Why do junior high kids want to be dropped off a block or so away from school? Have they suddenly felt the urge for some physical exercise? Are they worried that dear old dad is going to get caught in the traffic right around school and he'll be late for getting to work? No. They are ashamed of their parents. They don't want to be seen with them. It's not cool. And uh, the car they drive, ugh. Why worry about what college you're going to go to if you're going to die of shame when your mother drops you off in that bucket of bolts right in front of the school door? The unexpected way is shameful to Peter. He wants glory. He wants power. He wants a Lord who displays victory after victory. But Jesus seems to have accepted the unexpected way of suffering. He humbles himself under God the Father's almighty plans. Jesus has in mind the things of God. In this day of self-promotion, boasts and uh, downright falsified resumes. What is humility? Humility is a, a down-to-earth nature, an attitude that no one is unworthy of our attention or efforts, that we are all equals. We are here to help. Jesus showed 
that attitude repeatedly in his life. I've already mentioned about how he washed his disciples' feet. Jesus welcomed children. Jesus didn't treat women as second-class citizens, even if they were foreigners or caught in a flagrant scandal. He upheld the rights of tax collectors and sinners, those marginalized by the self-righteous religious elites. He touched people others might shy away from, the blind, the lame, the sick, even a dead little girl whom he raises her hand as he calls her back to life. Jesus only publicly rebukes Peter because of the public stir Peter's words have caused. Jesus can see it in the eyes of his disciples. They're confused. They are uncertain. They are afraid. The, the record has, has to be set straight. The unexpected way demands suffering, and it demands the humility to accept that suffering. The unexpected way also demands fellowship. Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. We are increasingly becoming a, a spectator society. Our music teachers, and we have an extraordinary number of them in our congregation, are struggling mightily to get our youth to see it is much more rewarding making music than simply listening to it. Uh, lots of couch potatoes love sports, to watch sports, but their blood pressure and other readings would be a whole lot better if they simply banged the basketball off the basketball hoop or ran a couple laps once in a while. I always get a rise out of my, my confirmation class when I'm teaching them about church fellowship, what it means to belong to a church. And, and I, I proudly say, I have a gym membership. Well, this year, one of the girls uh, gave me the stink eye. And uh, I asked her why she didn't want to say. I told her, hey, we, we've been in catechism class now for almost two years. We can be honest with each other. She ventured, you don't look like you belong to a gym. You're fat, I suggested. Yeah, you've got to go to the gym. You can't just pay them money every month. You can't just mail your Christianity in. Following Jesus is to participate in his suffering, to share in his sorrows. Fellowship means a sharing. Our fellowship with Jesus means we will deny ourself. The Apostle Paul lamented, the good I would I do not, but the evil I do not want to do, that I keep on doing. What a wretched man I am. He knew the battle between good and evil rages within as our sinful human nature, the old Adam, fights with the Christian, the new man within us. That's why it's so hard to do what is right. That's why it's so easy to let things sinfully slide. That's why our children look at us blankly and say, I don't know, when they've done something beyond the beyond. They're telling us the truth. The sinful human nature got the better of them. 
That's what we have to deny. That's what we have to starve out, to take advantage of others, to use others, to get our way by force or lies. That is what we are to give up. If we're looking for something to give up during the season of Lent, give up on that. Give up sinning. Give up losing our temper. Give up that potty mouth and take up our cross. That's what got Jesus into this whole situation to begin with. The cross was casting its shadow over his life. He was going to suffer and die on the cross. He was going to be arrested and condemned to the cross. He would pay for the sins of the world on the cross. So if we have fellowship with Jesus, if we are sharing with Jesus, it means the cross will cast its shadow across our lives as well. We started carrying the cross the day we were baptized. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. My sinful human nature was nailed to that tree when I was baptized. My old self was crucified, put to death, by the washing of water and the word. The Holy Spirit freed me from a life led only to sin and sin and miserably sin some more. We carry that cross every time we confess our sins. Every time we ask for forgiveness. We've been doing it so long, it, it doesn't seem like that heavy a burden, that big a deal to us anymore. Good for you. Godly habits are the best habits. Don't break them. But in our little ones, for a four-year-old at our preschool to admit what he did and say he is sorry, it usually means he dissolves into a puddle of, tear, of tears. It kills him or her. How can you not give them a big hug and tell them that they are forgiven and that we love them? And then Jesus tells us what else fellowship entails. Whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. To live for Jesus is to give up a life led for the self. A life led as though I am the highest good. And you don't have to be fed to the lions for Jesus' words to apply to you. You don't have to stand before a North Korean firing squad for smuggling in Bibles. Living the Christian life will be graciously rewarded by God with life eternal. You will live forever. I will be in heaven. I think Jesus is talking about Alexander the Great. His father, Philip of Macedon, conquered Greece, and Alexander conquered the world. His troops defeated the Persians and burned their capital city. Alexander was welcomed as a son of God in Egypt. He surmounted the Hindu Kush mountain range and entered Afghanistan. He fought against elephant armies in India. And at the age of 33, he died of malaria, leaving a pregnant wife whose child would be poisoned before he could ever claim to be king over a fallen empire. What good did it do Alexander? What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? What can Alexander the Great give in exchange for his soul? A man who conquered the world is a pauper when it comes to buying his way into heaven. Yet we, we, 
who have the merits of Jesus Christ, his holy life, his innocent sufferings and death, we who have the righteousness of Christ credited to our account by faith, we have preserved our life for all eternity. Never would have seen that one coming. It's the unexpected way. Suffering, humility, fellowship. Good thing none of us are God, huh? Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Lord God, maker and preserver of all, we praise and thank you for all you give us day after day. We are not worthy of the mercies you show us. May the word we have heard take root in our hearts and bear fruit in our lives, and may it encourage us to shine as lights in this sinful world. Heavenly Father, protect us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, the pain of disease, and the perils of the devil. Heal those who are sick, cheer those who are sad, calm those who are confused and give comfort to all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessing to every nation on earth. Where there are wars, let there be peace. Where there is hatred, let it be healed. Where there is poverty, danger, and disaster, come with your almighty power to help and restore. Protect those who travel by land, sea, and air. We pray especially that you keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless those who serve you at this place. Give them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring all these requests before you, dear Lord, and ask you to hear us. But above all, we give ourselves to you, that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Take what we have, gracious God, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our possessions and offerings, and use them to your glory. We ask this for Jesus' sake. In his name we are confident to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We hear the hymn response from Green Valley Lutheran School.
Join me in the closing prayer. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing the closing hymn. Thanks for watching our online worship presentation at Green Valley Evangelical Lutheran Church. Remember, you can contribute to the Lord's work through the ministry of Green Valley Evangelical Lutheran Church by hitting that donate button below the view screen on, your web, on the web page. Um, we've got the Wednesday adult Bible study going on, a thoroughly modern congregation look at 1 Corinthians. Uh, we've got the three, three times a, a month, we've got the Luther's Large Catechism on demand uh, study. It has a, a Facebook component. We've got a subgroup, Luther's Large Catechism. Our preschool currently has a registration going on for the next academic year, and we have limited openings for three year olds and four year olds. If you've got a child you're looking for early childhood center next, next school year, uh, give our, our school a call, 702-454-0004. That's about it now. Um, take care, be safe out there. See you next time.